let's sing. Shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable All of 
of my games now fade away Every crown no longer on display Here in your presence Heaven is trembling in all of your
Here in your presence, heaven and earth become one. Here in your presence, all things are new. Here in your presence, everything bows before you. God bless you, church. Well, good morning, Life Point. Happy Sunday. I hope you're having an awesome weekend, and it's just great to be with you. Sunday, May 31st. I mean, it's hard to believe that we are about to enter the sixth month of the year. You know, somebody said, well, the year started out, the Cowboys sucked, not in the Super Bowl. Then we had coronavirus, and then killer hornets. So what's next? We don't know. But we do know one thing. We don't know who holds the, what the future holds. But we know who holds the future, and we want to say, yes, God, you got this. So I am excited to be with you today, continuing in our series from the book of Philippians. I hope that you are reading through Philippians. I hope that you're getting a lot out of this series as we kind of examine this, this incredible book, and there's a lot of relevance for our lives. Now, uh, you know, I'm a former teacher, and uh, most of you know that I'm certified in ELA, English Language Arts and Reading, and part of what you do as a teacher, at the beginning of the year, before you even start the new material, you go over what they should already know. You go over the things that they have already learned. And after Christmas break, when you get back in January, you don't start with the new material. You go and review what they have learned that fall so that they are going to connect with the new material because, guys, guess what? they leak. Their minds leak. They forget what they've learned. And it's not just kids. I mean, all of us do uh, have leaks sometimes in what we know and what we think and what we remember. And so it's really important at times to kind of just go back and nail down some of the fundamentals. Go back and really get down to, to the heart of the matter. And when it comes to Christianity, the heart of the matter is always Jesus. 
the heart of the matter is always understanding who Christ is, why he came, what he did. And so what we're going to do today in this incredible passage from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, we touched on it a little bit last Sunday as we talked about how we can have a recipe for right relationships. But we're going to jump in a little bit deeper to talk about Jesus this morning. And the title of our message is Fix Your Eyes on Jesus. Now, one of my favorite authors has always been Max Lucado. Uh, Max is from San Antonio and pastors a great church down there. Plus, he has written tons of books. And I love this statement from, from one of Max's books. No wonder they call him Savior. It is such a great passage. And here's what he says. He says, what does it mean to be like Jesus? The world has never known a heart so pure or a character so flawless. His spiritual hearing was so keen, he never missed a heavenly whisper. His mercy was so abundant, he never missed a chance to forgive. No lie left his lips. No distraction marred his vision. He touched when others recoiled. He endured when others quit. Jesus is the ultimate model for every person. That's why God urges you to fix your eyes upon Jesus. Heaven invites you to set the lens of your heart on the heart of the Savior and make him the object of your life. Guys, I don't know any statement that, that is a better statement about why we should stop and think about Jesus and who he is. Jesus Christ is at the heart and center of everything we believe and everything we do as a church. In fact, the very term Christianity has its roots in Christ. And so what I want to do this morning is I want us to just take 20 minutes or so and fix our eyes on Jesus afresh and anew. You know, that's a biblical concept. It says in Hebrews 12 too, fix your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. I love that statement, fix your eyes on Jesus. Here's another great passage from Philippians. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, because he left heaven, because he came to earth, because he came to be a servant, because he died on the cross for our sins, therefore, now God has elevated him and exalted him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, this passage is what is called in theological terms a Christological passage. It is one of the most famous passages in the New Testament that really highlights who Jesus is and what he came to do. So what I want to do this morning is I want us to fix our eyes on Jesus, and I want us to walk through this passage and look at all the implications. In fact, there are five things that I want you to know as we walk through this passage. The first one is this. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at who he is. Paul says, Christ Jesus, though he was God. Now, I want you to just stop there. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ is absolutely, completely, totally God. He is not less than God. He is not a part of God. He's not an offshoot of God. He is God. And Paul emphasizes that statement. And guys, it is so important that we never, ever, ever make the mistake of thinking that Jesus really isn't God or isn't completely God or that he's simply a part of God. He is God. I've told you a story before, but I'll remind you of the Saturday morning I was at home, and, 
And I heard a knock on the door, and there was a couple of young guys at the door, and they were obviously Jehovah's Witnesses. I could tell by how they were dressed and what they were doing. And so I invited them in to just sit down and talk, and I always enjoyed having a dialogue with these guys. And, and we pulled out the Bible, and we began to look at Scripture. Now, one of the tenets of the Jehovah's Witness uh, uh, belief is that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Jesus Christ was not God. He was less than God. And in our Bible, if you were to look up uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was God, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the Word there, the capital W Word in, in John 1, 1 is, uh, is a reference to Jesus. In other words, in the beginning was Jesus, Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Is that, that idea? But in the, in the New, Trans, New World Translation of the Scriptures, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't have it that way. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, little g. You see, what Jehovah's Witnesses do, and the mistake that so many people make, is that they reduce who Jesus Christ really is. Church, let me talk to you from my heart. This is so, so important that you get it right. This is fundamental to your faith. Jesus Christ is God. Completely, totally, fully. And Paul says, Jesus Christ, though he was God, he didn't think equality with God, that is being the same as God, was something to cling to. Paul makes, uh, makes an emphatic statement of who Jesus is. Now, uh, this is the passage I mentioned earlier. I want you to just look at it with me because it's so very important that you see it. It is in uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 in the verse 18. The word Christ was in the beginning. The word was with God and the word was God. Okay? And this much loved son is beside the father. No man has ever seen God, but Jesus Christ has made God known to us. And so Jesus Christ is God. We need to understand that. In fact, look what it says in Colossians. Christ is exactly like God who cannot be seen. Okay? He's not a carbon copy. He's not a one-off. He's not a Xerox. Jesus Christ is exactly like God who cannot be seen. Now, why is that important? Because one of the things that we must always say is this statement. Jesus is fully God. It is at the heart and soul of everything we believe as Christians. So we fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at who he is. Okay, very, very important. Now, second thing I want you to see is that we fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at what he did. We look at what he did. All right? It says he was God. He didn't cling to the fact that he was God. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Okay? I want you to just circle those words, gave up. He voluntarily set aside his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was, read it out with me, born as a human being. Look what Jesus did. He was in heaven as God, worshipped as God, eternal with God, there in heaven as God, and he left heaven and he came to earth. That's what he did. It is so important that we understand that. That's why it says in John 1, 14, the word was God, that is Jesus, and Christ became human flesh and lived among us. That idea of human flesh is a theological word, if you're interested, called incarnation, in flesh. He came to earth and he took on an earth suit. He took on a body. He had skin and he had muscle and he had bones and he had organs just like us. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, the fact that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, was born in human form. Look at what he did. He did that for us. And I love in 1 Timothy how Paul puts it. Here is the great mystery of our faith. Christ came as a human being. And so it is a mystery because how can we fully fathom that Jesus Christ is totally God and totally man at the same time? How can we fathom 
that he is still fully God, even though he voluntarily set aside his divine rights and privileges of God, and he became human. It is a mystery, but we affirm, we look at who he is, and we say he's fully God. We look at what he did, and we say he is fully man. He became a man just like us. You see, this is the great thing that we've got to understand, church, because I really believe that we're in a battle, and we're in a battle for right theology. We're in a battle for sound biblical doctrine. We're in a battle for our souls, and, and part of how cults operate, how false teachers operate, is that they, they all acknowledge Jesus, but they always either put a plus sign after his name or a minus sign after his name. Yeah, Jesus is a great guy, and you need Jesus plus this. Yeah, Jesus is a great guy, but Jesus really isn't God minus this. And you can always mark down whether or not somebody is really teaching Scripture and whether or not they are theologically sound by what did they say, what did they teach, what did they believe about who Jesus Christ really is. Because the Bible makes it clear that as we fix our eyes on Jesus, we see who he is, that he is fully God. When we fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at what he did, we realize that he voluntarily left heaven and came to earth and became fully human. Okay? And so that is why it is so important. Look at what he did. He voluntarily relinquished all of the honor, all of the glory, all of the praise that had been his all for eternity. He stepped out of heaven and stepped into earth and he took the place of a human being. That is amazing, okay? And remember, I'm your teacher, and I'm reviewing the fundamentals of our faith. And so the first fundamentals of our faith are Jesus is fully, completely, totally God, and he is also fully, completely, totally man at the same time. Now, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, the third thing I want to tell you from this passage is that we look at why he came, okay? We look at who he is, he's God, we look at what he did. He left heaven and became a man. And we look at why he came. What was the reason for the incarnation? What was the reason for Jesus to leave heaven and come to earth? Why did he do such a dramatic thing? Look at Paul says, he answers it. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now, there's, there's some very significant stuff I want you to see in the verse. First of all, again, he was a human. He was fully man. But he humbled himself in obedience to God. Why does it say in obedience to God? Because Christ's coming was all part of God's eternal plan of salvation. You see, this is unfathomable, but I want you to get it. If we could go way, way back in history before the world was ever made, before anything was made, and there was God in heaven, and God in his mind had already planned out the creation of the world. God already in his mind had already planned out that human beings would occupy the earth. And God already knew in his mind that at some point, human beings were going to sin. They were going to rebel. They were going to turn away from him. And in his mind, he had already come up with a plan to save them before he ever made the world. That is why it says he humbled himself in obedience to God because Jesus Christ cooperated with God's plan of salvation when he came to this earth and when he ultimately died a criminal's death on the cross. Why he came was to die. Why he lived his life was so that he could end up on the cross. I think it's really significant, church, that when we look at the Christmas story, I love the characters in the Christmas story, you have the Virgin Mary, this young teenage girl who was uh, chosen by God to, to be the mother of Jesus. And then we have her husband or the man she was engaged to named Joseph. And the minute that he heard Mary was going to have a baby, of course, in his human mind, he felt like that she'd cheated on him, that she'd become pregnant with another man. And it, even though he loved her, it said that he was going to kind of divorce her privately. He was going to kind of end the relationship privately, not to humiliate her. And an angel came to Joseph and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife because the baby inside of her has come from God and you will call him Jesus. And this is significant 
because he will save his people from their sins. From the very beginning, even from the conception of Jesus inside Mary by the Holy Spirit, Jesus' purpose was clear. Why he came was so that he could die. Fully God, fully man, and he had a purpose. He came to earth to die on the cross for us. Look what the Bible says. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Look at this one. That's why, that's what Christ did definitively. He suffered because of other sins. The righteous one, he is God, for the unrighteous ones, us. He went through all of this. He went through it all. He was put to death and then made alive. And why did he do it? Look at those last five words. Say them out loud with me. To bring us to God. Church, this is what is so exciting. The very reason why Jesus came was so that God could have a relationship with you. The very reason Jesus came was so that he, through his sacrificial death, could bring us to God. So let's review. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at who he is. Who is he? He's fully God. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at what he did. What did he do? He left heaven and came to earth and became a human being. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at why he came. Why did he do what he did? So that he could save us so that we could be forgiven. I love that. Look at this passage. Our freedom was purchased with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. Jesus Christ had to be a sacrifice, had to give his life on the cross so that we could be forgiven. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The pay for sin is death. Because I've sinned and because you've sinned, we deserve death. Somebody has to die for sins. And God said, that's right. I'll send Jesus and he'll take your place and he'll die for your sins. That's amazing. Why did he come? He came to be our savior. Here's the point. Jesus sacrificially gave his life on the cross. He's God, completely. He's man, completely. And he died on the cross on your behalf and my behalf. Then Paul says something else. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at how he lived. Now, I touched on this last week because I talked about the fact that if we're going to have right relationships, we need to look to a model. We need to have a mentor. We need to have somebody to show us how to do it. And the whole reason why Jesus lived this perfect life on earth was so that he could be an example to us, not only in the realm of relationships, but every part of life. And so when we fix our eyes on him, we look at how he lived. In fact, it says, you must have the same attitude that Jesus had. How you treat people, treat them like Jesus did. How you talk, talk like Jesus did. How you love, love like Jesus did. How do you face adversity? Face adversity like Jesus did. How do you go through hard times? You do it the way Jesus did. How do you sacrifice your life? You do it the way Jesus did. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. The whole point of his coming was to die on the cross. But during that period of his ministry, his earthly ministry, he did good. He went around helping people. He went around to be an example to us. That's why it says, I set an example, and you should do for each other exactly what I have done for you. First Peter says, this is what you are called to do, because Jesus suffered for you and gave you, say it with me, an example to follow, so you should do as he did. If you are ever questioning a decision, think about what would Jesus do in this situation? If you ever wanting to know how to relate to somebody, ask, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus relate to this person? You see, the life of Christ is a model, it is a mentor, it is a template, it is an example for us. I remember when our two youngest daughters, Carrie and Bethany, were little, we bought this, this set of letter templates. They were plastic sheets. They were about four by four or five by five. And they had the alphabet cut out in, in these plastic sheets. And what they did is they could take their pencil inside the template and they could learn how to form the letters correctly. And so the template had all of the letters of the alphabet. 
and it was a way to show them how to write the alphabet and they learned how to write the letters correctly by using the template. That's what Jesus Christ is to us. He's our template to show us how we should live and how he lived. That's why the Bible says this. This is the kind of life you've been called, you've been invited into, the kind of life that Christ lived. He suffered everything that would come his way so you would know that it could be done and also how to do it step by step. Now, let me tell you something. I am the least mechanical person in this church. I know that. Okay, I don't know how to work on cars. I don't know how to do carpentry stuff. I'm not good at home repair. But, you know, sometimes I'll get an idea that I'm going to fix something. Now, my wife's already laughing, I can tell. I'm going to fix something, right? And so what's cool now is, is you can go on something called YouTube and you can pull up a video that's going to help you to know how to do what you need to do step by step. If you want to learn to play guitar, find some videos. If you want to learn to cook, find some videos. If you want to learn how to repair something, find some videos. And my favorite ones are the ones that actually slowly take you through. You do this, and they show you how. You do this next, they show you how. You do this next, and then you get to the end of it, and hopefully it's right. Now, nine times out of ten with me, it doesn't work that way. But for the most part, if you follow the instructions step by step, you're going to get the end result that's going to be good. The Bible says Jesus Christ came so that we would know how to live life. We would know how it could be done, and we would know how to do it step by step by step. And so as you read Matthew, as you read Mark, as you read Luke, as you read John, as you read through the stories of how Jesus interacted with people, as you read through the stories of how Jesus went through his earthly life, you are going to find ways to live by following his example. It is amazing that we should be able to do that, okay? So I want you to get that, all right? So let's talk about where we've been. Jesus Christ, who he is, fully God. Jesus Christ, what he did, he left heaven and came to earth to become a man. Jesus Christ, why he came, so that he could die on the cross. Jesus Christ, how he lived, we look at how he lived and we see that he lived this life that is an example to us, a template for us. And he showed us how we should live our lives. You know, one of the things I, I love to look at, one of my, really one of my favorite things to do in, when I read the Gospels is look at some of the conversations Jesus had, some of the one-off conversations he had. And it's really interesting how tender, how compassionate, how caring, how he loved people. And it just touches my heart to think about how Jesus Christ showed us how we should live our lives. Okay, look at the next one. We fix our eyes on Jesus, and we look at where he is. If I were to ask you a question, where is Jesus right now, what would you say? You'd probably say, well, I, he's in heaven. Well, he is in heaven, yes. That's absolutely true. But it's even more than that, how the Bible describes it. Therefore, because Jesus left heaven, came to earth, lived a human life, died a sacrificial death, gave his life to complete the plan of salvation, therefore, because of all that he did, look at it, God elevated him to the place of highest honor. Not only is Jesus in heaven, guys, but Jesus is in heaven in the place of highest honor. The Bible describes it as being seated at the right hand of the Father. If you went to a, a dinner party in the first century, the right hand next to the host is a place of honor. It is where the guest of honor would be. Today, we put guests of honor on an elevated table in front of everybody, but in that day, it is the place of honor sitting right next to the host at the right hand. The Bible says God elevated Christ. Elevated means lifted him up high to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Where is Jesus? He's in heaven, he's at the right hand of the Father, he's in a place of honor. He is Lord. Now, what is the implication of that statement? 
The implication of that statement is that because Jesus Christ is in this highest place, he needs to have the highest place of honor in our lives. Are you with me on that, church? Because he is seated at the right hand of the Father, because he has this position of highest honor, because everything and everyone of all time is going to one day bow down and acknowledge his lordship, we have the opportunity now to crown him as Lord of our lives and give him that place of honor. The Bible says that after he stepped up to offer his sacrifice for sins for all time, he then sat down in the position of honor at the right hand of God. The Bible says Jesus is the one God honored by giving him a place at his right side. He made him our leader and our savior. Wow. You know, I read Philippians chapter 2, and I look at these passages, and I think about the vast array of people in human history. I think about the people like Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great. We think about King Herod. We think about Napoleon Bonaparte. We think about Adolf Hitler. We think about Saddam Hussein. We think about all of the men and women throughout history that have lived their life. Men and women who oftentimes live their lives totally against God, disbelieving God, dishonoring God. Do you know that every person that ever drew a breath on this planet is going to one day fall face down and acknowledge that he's Lord? Now let that sink in for a minute. Every person from all time throughout human history, and I don't know how, when, where it's going to take place, but the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. So the Lady Gagas of the world, the Charles Mansons of the world, the Attila Huns of the world, every person will one day fall on their face and they will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know the tragedy of that, guys? The tragedy of that is that some people will only acknowledge him when it's too late. The tragedy is that some people will acknowledge him in judgment when we have the opportunity now to all acknowledge him in love and surrender. You see the difference? At that point, there will be no choice. It will be obvious how they've lived their life and what they believe was totally wrong. And at that place in, in, in the future judgment, they will all acknowledge his lordship. But we have an opportunity right now. We have an opportunity today to give him the place that he deserves, the place of highest honor in our lives. Jesus is our eternal Lord, and he alone deserves our worship so where have we been we look at jesus we fix our eyes on him and we look at who he is say it with me he is god we fix our eyes on jesus and we look at what he did what did he do he left heaven and became a human being he is fully man we fix our eyes on jesus and we look at why he came and when we look at why he came we see the cross looming before us as he hangs there bleeding and dying in agony for our sins. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we look at how he lived and we realized that everything he did, everything he said, how he treated people, how he responded to, to adversity and problems, everything that Jesus did was an intentional thing to be a model and a template for us. And we look at, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, where he is right now, and he is seated in the place of highest honor in heaven. And we can give him that place in our own lives. But there's one more thing I want you to see, guys. Because we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And if we've never, ever, ever done it, we need to open our hearts and let him in. You see, you can't read Scripture without coming away from really from Genesis all the way to Revelation. You cannot read those 66 books of the Bible without coming away with one great thought. God loves us and wants a relationship with us. Every book in the Bible weaves in the thought that God in heaven loves us, his people, 
and he wants to have a relationship with us. The Bible makes it clear, church, that every person is God's creation, but not every person is God's child. Every person is God's creation, but not every person is God's child. We only become God's child as we open up our hearts and let him in to be our Savior and Lord. And so I want to end this message by by really challenging you as we have looked at Jesus, as we have seen him as God and we've seen him as man and we've seen him as a sacrificial savior and we've seen him as an example and we've seen him as the exalted King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me ask you this question. Is that Jesus your savior? Is he living in your heart? I'll never forget. Somebody said that the journey between heaven and hell is 18 inches long. And I never really understood what that statement is, but but just take it with me for a minute. The journey from heaven to hell is 18 inches long, and that is the difference, and that is the measurement between our head and our heart. Somebody said it's about 18 inches from your head to your heart. What does that mean? You can know everything about Jesus in your mind, but never, ever have him in your heart. You can know everything there is to know about Jesus And you can know everything that he said and everything that you can memorize the Bible. You can go to church. You can be baptized. You can pray. You can give money. You can serve others. But if you've never, ever, ever opened your heart to establish a relationship with him, it's all just knowledge. It's not experience. It's not relational. And so this 18-inch journey is where you decide that it's not just going to be head knowledge, but it's going to be a heart relationship and you open your heart and let him in. I love the words of Jesus from Revelation chapter 3. Now, I know that in the context, he's not specifically speaking about a relationship, but the words that he says are, are so appropriate and so relevant and so timely because he says, look at me. I stand at the door and knock. That's the image of the door of your heart. And if you hear me call, And if you open the door, four of the most wonderful, awesome words in Bible follow. He says, if you do that, I'll come in, I'll come right in. I'll come right into your life. And so you see him, and you hear him, and he's knocking, and he's calling, and you open the door. And if you open the door, he says, when you do that, I'll come into your life and we can have a relationship. But let me tell you something, church. Please understand this. As much as God wants a relationship with you, you have to choose it. As much as God wants a relationship with you, he's not going to break the door of your heart down. Okay? He's not going to get one of those battering rams we see on detective shows where the police and the SWAT team goes in and knocks the door down. That's not how God operates. God waits for you to open the door to him. You know, I I share this story with kids a lot because I think that they kind of get it, but there's a very famous painting that is based on Revelation 3.20, the verse I just read. And in the painting, there's this big, beautiful arch door, and there's this picture of Jesus in the artist's rendition, you know, the white robe and the blue sash and the hair and the beard, and, and he's got his hand up like he's knocking on the door, Okay. There's a tree branch in there. It's a really pretty picture. And there's something very unique about the way the artist painted the picture. And that is that there is no doorknob on the door on the outside. Now, it wasn't an oversight. The artist intentionally painted the picture without a doorknob. And that lack of a doorknob symbolizes something very important about salvation. That is that you can only open the door of your heart from the inside. You have to open the door from the inside. There's no doorknob on the outside. And so if you fix your eyes on Jesus, it means that you open your heart and you let him in. Because guys, even this morning, you might hear him knocking. Maybe you hear him when you're laying in bed at night and he's he's just tugging at your heart saying, you need me. You need to open your heart to me. Let me in your heart. I love you. I want to make your life. I want to change your life. I want to take you to heaven. You hear Jesus talking to you. And if and when you open the door of your heart, something miraculous happens. It says in John 1, 12, that he gave the right 
and he gave the power to become children of God. Now, remember, I said earlier, everybody's God's creation, not everybody's children. His children, how do we become his children? We receive him into our life. We invite him to come into our life. He gave the right, he gave the power to become children of God to those who said out loud with me right now, received him. Not to those who went to church, not to those who do nice things, not to those who read the Bible, not to those who give money, not to those who are religious. He gives the right and the power to become children to those who receive him. Receiving him is the same thing as opening the door of your heart to him. It means that you receive him into your life. You invite him into your life. You want him to come into your life. He gave this to those who put their trust in his name. Now, let me tell you something, church. He is God, and he's man, and he died on a cross sacrificially for you. He lived a life to be a model and a template for us, and he is seated right now in a place of highest honor. But the most important thing I want to tell you in this message is this. He wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you. I'll never forget when I was a young Christian, very, very young, and I was just learning the ropes of this stuff. I'll never forget our pastor said, and it's always stuck with me, he said something that was so profound. He said, if you had been the only person on the planet and you needed a Savior, Jesus would have died for you. If you were the only person on the entire planet and you were lost and bound for hell and you needed a Savior, Jesus would still have died for you. Yes, for God so loved the world, he gave his son. But God so loved you that he gave his son. And what the implications of that is, that Jesus Christ wants to have a relationship with you and he wants to have this connection with you where you aren't just one of his creations, you're one of his children. That you have opened the door of your heart and you've let him come in. You see this great passage that Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 is this great, powerful, Christological uh, passage full of theology. And in that passage, he says, Jesus is completely, fully God. Jesus is completely, fully man. Jesus came to earth to die on a cross. Jesus Christ came so they could show us how to live our life. Jesus Christ has now ascended and exalted in a place of highest honor. But Jesus Christ can be your savior if you let him and so right now guys i just want to lead us in prayer and i want to ask you to do something if you are not sure that you have ever asked jesus into your life i want you to invite him that passage earlier said if you hear his voice if you open the door he said i'll come in right now and if you've never ever ever done that in your life church i want to invite you to do that because the most important thing you can do is knowing Jesus as your Savior. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time we've had together today. And Lord, I thank you that you are such an incredible Savior. That you are willing to give up the splendor and honor and divine privileges of heaven. And you are willing to step out of heaven and come to earth and live on this planet as one of us. And Lord, that you humbled yourself not only to humanity, but you humbled yourself so that you would die a criminal's death on a cross. And Lord, as you hung there and bled there and died there, you did it so that we could have salvation. And so, Lord, thank you for that gift. And Lord, it's my prayer, if there's somebody in our church, somebody watching this broadcast, somebody that's never, ever opened their heart to you, that this would be the day, this would be the moment, this would be the time that they would just stop right where they're in their living room, their family room, wherever they're watching this, and they just pray with me. And it's a simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I realize today how much you love me, that you want a relationship with me. I realize that I'm a sinful person and I need a Savior. I realize I can't save myself. And if I've never, ever done it before, Lord, Right now, I want to open the door of my heart to you. I willingly unlock that door and open it so that you can come in. 
Lord Jesus, come into my heart right now. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Forgive my sin. Make me a new person. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Lord, I don't understand all that it means, but I trust that you have done what you said you'd do. I trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you heard his voice and you opened the door, what did he say do? I will come in. So if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, maybe you've never prayed it before, but you prayed it with me and you meant it, where is he right now? Right in your heart. And you have started a journey of salvation that's amazing. So you need to be encouraged because you have a relationship with Jesus and it is amazing. And guys, let me tell you something. We want to help you. So if you prayed that prayer today, I want you to do something. I want you to take my number. There it is on screen. I want you to text me and just say, Pastor Chuck, I prayed the prayer today because I want to send you some material. I want to follow up and make sure this decision is really uh, you know, fortified and solidified in your life. I want to I want to help you through that. So if you prayed that prayer and you invited Christ right now, just take down my number, get your phone and just, just put my number and text me and say, hey, Pastor Chuck, I prayed the prayer, okay? That's amazing. So thank you guys so very much for being here. Contact me this week if you need anything. Remember, next Sunday, June 7th, we're scheduled uh, to reopen down here in Crowley, have our uh, first in-person service since March. So we definitely want you to be a part of that. You'll hear more about it this week. We'll be sending out email with all of our protocols that we're going to have in place. Uh, last week, I reminded you, and I'm going to do it again today, take out your cell phone right now if you haven't done it. Guys, I want you to have the material from Right Now Media. It is going to help you grow. There's over 10,000 resources there. All you got to do is text right now, one word, and then a space, and then LP, TC, TX. Just put that in there and then text it to 41. 411 and you'll immediately get a link on your phone that you can type that you can access the website it's going to be amazing do that again if you haven't gotten our app download it today you've got your phone out anyway so download it and then again thank you church so much for your giving your faithfulness hey i love you church i can't wait to be with you next week so we're going to have a great time let's pray 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 for great things to happen okay thank you guys for tuning in and I hope you have an awesome Sunday afternoon. We love you.